going to hit, just kind of jump around a little bit, kind of hit a couple different areas uh, that we're watching pretty closely. And obviously, there's a lot of concern uh, about our November election next year. So much is riding. So much is riding. And only God knows how the next 12 months are going to play out. We have so many things uh, that are happening. Um, I touched on some of this last year, but I think it's important uh, for us to re, re uh, surface or actually go over it again. Uh, this is Joseph Stalin, Premier of the Soviet Union's belief. The people who cast the votes don't decide an election. It's the people who count the votes that do. And like I shared just before the break, a lot of effort is being done to make sure that the elections being processed accordingly, you don't know what happens once those paper ballots get in the machine. That was the problem in Brazil. They have the Smartmatic equipment, but it, there's no paper ballot. So you're very susceptible. But then again, we had audits in 2020 in Arizona. They spent a fortune, they spent months, they audited it. Think Exactly. We kept hearing the results are going to be in a week, two weeks, a month, three months. We never heard the results. And, you know, we, a lot of the problems, I mean, here you have Mike Lindell spends $40 million uh, and, and no results. Not, not a single victory that I know of. And I, t I saw him last year here at CPAC in Dallas, and he was going to have, he was two weeks away from his big Springfield, Missouri event that was going to bring people in from all 50 states that were going to uh, explain the improprieties in the last election. He just says, we are about ready to see voting in America change dramatically. He was so excited, he was giddy, and nothing happened. He had his event, and nothing, nothing happened. Um, when Tony and I met with uh, President Bolsonaro, I said, President Bolsonaro, uh, your son Eduardo is a good friend of Mike Lindell. Mike's even offered to send his uh, forensic people to Brazil to assist to look at the equipment. Uh, but Mike's at that time had spent 25 million, and hadn't had a single victory. So I, don't, I honestly, I don't. And you have a more difficult situation because there's no paper ballot. You have a much more difficult uh, chance of seeing any kind of election turnaround or, or change. So that's just uh, where we are today. And I said this last November, I'm praying what happened with the Brazilian vote in October 2020 won't happen in the U.S. While millions of Republicans were working hard to get out the vote, billions of dollars was spent. The voting, voting machine fraudsters were planning their electronic election manipulation. Fraudsters might be a, a heavy term, uh, but I just sense in the spirit, like a lot of you all, there was improprieties that could not be proven. And in 2016, when Hillary lost, the Democrats on Capitol Hill brought in some of the top voting machine experts in America Jewish and other top, I mean, I remember this Jewish guy from Michigan says there's not a machine that can be hacked. And all these people came because Hillary lost and said, every machine's vulnerable. And this is a big, a big issue. And I, you know, I saw a lot of Lindell's cases. I follow them. You get the wrong judge, and it stops it. Or you get through one phase, and the next judge stops it. So it was a battle with the judges on any of these cases going forward. What about uh, 2,000 mules? All these votes were dropped off in these boxes with, you know, uh, tracking and everything. Nothing happened. So that's, you know, we just have to do everything we can on the precinct level right now to make sure of a fair and equitable election. And again, Christians must vote. The apathy in the church has cost us dearly uh, for many years. And again, vote fraud has been successful in two of the largest countries, largest, most productive countries in the world, the United States and Brazil. But last year, 
the U.S. midterm election, we were hearing about the red wave. I mean, this was the big talk. This is a red wave, whether it was Steve Bannon, whether it's Fox, whether it was uh, Newsmax, conservative uh, websites, they were saying the red wave is coming. And then I saw the fact that we're going to have a blood moon over America on the day before and the day of the election. I go, oh, no. The blood red moon, the omen of war, conflict, not coincidentally just happened to be over Washington, D.C. and New York on the day of the election. And I, I felt that that did not bode well for the United, United States, especially the Republicans. It didn't happen. We had the unpopular Biden successful, have a successful midterm election where Clinton, Bush, and Obama, and Trump all had big losses. This is very normal for an incumbent to have big losses at the midterm. And then the voting machine manipulation. Is it becoming so sophisticated? It's becoming stealth? I've sensed that, that they can go in and make a change and be out of the system before you could even, uh, with, with no path, with no track. I mean, it, we even had the Clintons, Obama, Biden state that the future of America's democracy was at risk because of a possible major Republican victory. Former presidents, they had their mainstream media saying the same thing. The commentators at MSNBC and CNN called Republicans fascist, stated that this is going to be an enormous problem. They were preparing us for civil war in our communities. And then the Democrats thought they could win with abortion, LGBTQ, and critical race theory. It did help them. Polls showed those issues low in the voters' mind, but it was just enough votes to win close races. I have members uh, in, in my family, or my late mother was a former president of Amer uh, Democratic Women in Arizona and a conservative Christian. She did not, uh, uh, she did not, uh, a conservative Democrat, born again just before she passed away as an Episcopalian, but she, her party left her. Clinton, Obama left her. Now we have a party of abortion, LGBTQ agenda, grooming, same-sex marriage, gender confusion, Criti uh, critical race theory, lawlessness, climate control lunacy. Speaking of lawlessness, they were prepping cities around the United States in the event the Republicans won in 2020 or 2022. And most of those were heavily controlled blue, blue cities in, in blue states. Fiscal irresponsibility, coronavirus uh, requirements on vaccination, lockdowns, allowing Chinese influence, divisive rhetoric and speech. I remember right before the 2022 election, there was members of, of the Democratic Party going on MSNBC, CNN, other pundits saying, we've got to stop this hate speech. We've got to stop this speech that is, that is in violation of our democratic ways. They were trying through the Facebook and social networks to stop anybody from our side, where you got 80% of the, of the uh, universities in the United States that will not allow a conservative, especially a Christian speaker on their campus. They'll either harass them or cancel them. They don't want to hear what we have to say. We're curious where they're coming from, but they don't want to know where we're coming from. And that's a problem. I mean, to the point that they're going to restrict free speech, to the, that it was going to be, and, and we saw that with uh, social networks, uh, constant contact, uh, uh, some of the other email programs that would cancel us if we said something with doctors like McCullough and others against coronavirus. And that happened to us, Dr. McCullough and others. 
that would speak boldly, and we would get canceled. And, and so that was a, that was a real attack. Uh, and then, unfortunately, we had the Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the White House in 2020. I wrote a commentary in August of 2020. There's 31 items in the Democratic platform and agenda that are in direct opposition or violation of the Bible. I don't know how people can stay, they call themselves Christians, that can stay in the Democratic Party today. I can't. And their two main platform items that they're going to run on in 2024 is abortion. And unfortunately, in Virginia and Ohio and some other states, that costs that cost the Republicans. And they, and I think Wisconsin and a couple others, uh, maybe Michigan, Minnesota, but it, abortion has become their number one platform item. And LGBTQ right behind it. And progressive control. I know some of the, uh, when I was in Washington, D.C., some of the people would say, I'm a progressive. I go, where has there been progress? Progressive is a derivative of progress. Where is the progress? That's right. It's led to the, thanks, Tommy, antichrist spirit. Amazing. Or how do you come up with these conclusions? You don't connect the dots. This level of deception, spiritual deception, or, or, or the, the scripture, uh, my opening scripture in the, in the Obama book, revealed Obama's legacy, Isaiah 520. What are those that call evil good and good evil? And that's what we're dealing with today. Tony and I were at a, a meeting today, uh, Park City's Republican women over in Dallas. And Brooke Rollins, who was with the Trump administration, and Linda, Linda McMahon uh, spoke to us. They were, uh, it was a Q&A with them. And uh, they were talking about all the headway that we were making state by state, city by city, com uh, co company by company, and all the possibilities. And they say that we really, really have to get to work. We have to get to work to, to turn around America. But half of America, maybe more, is very supportive of these two main platform items of the Democratic Party, and we will never see eye to eye. So that as far as unity and changing in America, and unfortunately over half the Protestants and half the Catholics support same-sex marriage. Evangelicals, 20%, now it's about 30%. How can you change it? This is what, when you really look at the division of America, when you talk about unity, it cannot be unity because of those, those two main items. So it's not, it's, it's not possible. It's disruptive and judgmental. Nothing more divisive. They're after the children, and I know the Bible is real serious about the Lord, and he is with the young children. The Matthew, the millstone around the neck. And I tell you, they are across the lines, what they're doing with the young people of America, this agenda. The social networks, their influence, TikTok especially. I heard a, a Wall Street guy talking about TikTok's influence, that they have three distinctive algorithms that determine behavior and then they influence accordingly. And the TikTok the United States and the United Kingdom have is not what they are seeing in China. It's not the same. That is so destructive, what they've been able to accomplish through TikTok. And I, uh, another thing, uh, General Jack Keane was on, uh, on Fox about three months ago, and he said that China has 100,000 people, that all they do day in, day out, is how to take down America. That's their job. They're very patient, very strategic, and they got a plan, very similar to the Persians. And uh, today, uh, a father sued a school district for refusing to display a straight pride flag alongside a progress pride flag. Christian parents complain after 11-year-old daughter was forced to share a bed with a biological male on a school trip. 
I mean, you, you can't even believe this is happening. I say this probably too often. I never thought we would live in a day like this. This, this absurdity. And the U.S. Pol political division, we have a, the Trump factor that a lot of people appreciate. It was always interesting for me over the years speaking to groups. Uh, the Christians appreciated George W., especially, you know, he's very close to the Protestants and Catholics. But they really liked Trump in a very unique way. The alpha male, you know, he took things on. He had 35, 40 people that were evangelical, that were part of his prayer team. If they needed, they'd flock back to the White House. Pastor Romero Pena, a good friend of Tanya and mine, he's part of the group. Michelle Bachman and others, one of Tony Perkins' family research. When Trump needed something, boom, they were in Washington in the Oval Office praying. And that was, and that was substantial. But there is a fatigue and an exhaustion of people that uh, support Trump. But he has a loyal base because he cares about a middle, middle, middle America. I mean, a lot of people complain in America, but when, when they believe when Trump was in office, their complaints could be addressed. And he addressed them. And he'll go down historically as one of the best presidents we had, despite what he went through on a daily basis. Not a perfect vessel by any stretch, but I tell you, he was the best friend the Christians had in the White House and the greatest access to evangelical Christians because of him. 2024, uh, we'll get into that shortly, but uh, uh, House investigations. Fortunately, now we have a Republican majority in the House so w uh, with Jim Jordan and judiciary. They're going, to, they're going to keep going after Hunter Biden and Joe Biden, and, it, and hopefully all that will be revealed. And uh, Attorney G uh, Merrick Garland and also uh, FBI Director under a lot of uh, pressure from the Republicans to do more. But here's the election for 2024. Uh, at this point, um, right in the middle is about 62 votes that could go either to the Democrats or Republicans. You need, you need 270 to become President of the United States. So right now, it looks pretty strong, 241, 235, and in the middle, it's about 62. And maybe some of the other, other uh, sites. So if you add 62 to 235, that's uh, uh, 297. Uh, that's 27 more than you need. So a lot can happen, but you know, only God knows who's going to be the candidate for the Republican Democratic Party in 2024. Um, Right now, uh, Trump's still very strong. Uh, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, uh, it's really kind of down to those three right now. There, there was a possibility that uh, Governor Yunkin, who has done a good job in Virginia, might be the guy, but unfortunately, their midterm election didn't go very well for him. And so some of the uh, hope in, uh, in Virginia kind of affected his, uh, his uh, rise in the Republican Party. So I think right now, Trump, DeSantis, and Nikki Haley and look what Trump goes through on a daily basis. I, mean, I can't even imagine anybody on this planet being able to handle what he does. I mean, it's just every single day. doesn't help himself at times, but this is ridiculous. Democrats, Gavin Newsom and Joe Biden. I didn't watch the Newsom-DeSantis uh, debate that night, but I, I heard DeSantis did a nice, very good job, and Newsom wasn't very impressive. So uh, we'll see. And I tell you, Robert F. Kennedy might be the Ross Perot of this election. Ross Perot in 1990 very likely, despite the Clinton people, it cost George Bush the presidency. And there's a very good chance Robert F. Kennedy is so strong on vaccines, on child defense and things like that. I mean, the guy is really strong in some issues. Uh, there's a chance he'll take enough votes from the Democratic Party to possibly be very beneficial to Republicans. We'll see, but uh, he, and he's got the Democrats nervous right now. Then the Senate seats, we have 34 up. Uh, uh, including a special election in Nebraska, 23 are held by Democrats or independents. At this point, 48 and 49 and, and three up. Um, and then we have the U.S. House race, 218 seats, uh, 203, 207 right now. They look pretty secure. And then we have the, the ones there in the middle. I think it says 25. So... Um, it's close. I mean, this is a divided country. I mean, it is outside of the, the concerns about the, the equipment, the machines. And then 
we have a part of our population, could 2024 election cause society to collapse? Some preppers think so and they're ready. Well, this is kind of what the mainstream media was doing with the 2020 and the 2022 election, that life as we know it, our democracy is at risk, as I shared. But you know, you all know, we're a constitutional republic. We're the, a unique form of government with three branches, legislative, judicial, and executive. You know, problem is they usurp other boundaries uh, that are obligated, but this is, you're gonna start seeing, if the Republicans start moving into positions of influence, democracy as know it will once be again at, at risk. This is just a couple days ago, the UN launches a Gates-funded global digit digital ID program as experts warn of totalitarian nightmare, December 1. You can't believe this stuff is happening, but it is. It, it's just part of the final days. There's no way around it. They think they've got a better solution. Texas sues Pfizer for false and deceptive marketing. They tried to get rid of Ken Paxton. It didn't work. Ken Paxton is one of the most effective attorney generals in America. And he's rallied the 19 attorney, or the other 18, there's a team of about 19 that work very much lockstep, and Ken Paxton has been one of those leaders, and essential with the other 18 conservative attorney generals. World Health Organization concerns, sparks concern about our power grab through global pandemic treaty. Michelle Bachman, Tony Perkins, Family Research has been following this very closely. They are trying to get the United States to comply to the World Health Organization. That, that we empower them to tell us when America goes into a lockdown and how we have to shut down or we have to close our churches or we have to close our schools. We're forced and mandated to take a vaccine whether we want to or not. We're forced to mask. Uh, we are forced to whatever it is that they tell us and we have to do. We've never been in history in 5,000 years of recorded human history. We've never seen the level of authority given to an international global entity. And this is a fight. They almost pulled it off last year. Michelle and others are, are watching this closely. This is serious. And I mean, Europe right now is uh, talking about us having to have a uh, a visa again. Brazil's uh, possibly going to do that. So they're going to they're going to they're going to force us in order to travel to comply, and we got to just stay out of this. The Biden administration wants to go along with this, and we have to do everything we can to stop it. Unfortunately, we have some people keeping an eye on it. And the one world order and pandemic that we saw with the coronavirus. But we all know that no man might buy or sell, save that, that he had the mark or had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's a number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. We're living this day. Probably one of the most uh, worrisome individuals involved with the uh, World Economic Forum is a guy named Yuval Harari. He's, a, he's Jewish, he's from Tel Aviv, and he is marginalizing in talking about basically creating a new religion based on technocracy, technology, and getting to the point that all these other things, a society, the politics, the religion, and ideology will be under question, and that we're moving into a new era. And I remember uh, hearing a lady with the, the Financial Times uh, interview him, and he was talking about being implanted with a chip that will have an impact in our lives. I mean, it could be the digital passport, uh, transaction, uh, on and on. And he said the only concern that he has that those chips could be possibly hacked. Hacked. So that completely alarmed the lady with the Financial Times. But 
this is the this is where we're going. We're not going in the right direction with this. And uh, and then of course you all know about Klaus Schwab, how to how to fix a global trust crisis. You know, we have over 50 initiative platforms for public-private co cooperation, and I'm, and I'm very proud to say since the beginning of the crisis, the coronavirus crisis, we won over 200 additional partners who joined us without knowing when they could go to Davos or not. I looked at a um, uh, Schwab uh, corporate uh, page the other day, and they have all our major U.S. corporations, and I talked about this last year, the environment social governance rating. <clears throat> if you look at the, the Schmidt, I mean uh, Schwab website, every one of the companies is rated. And this is part, fortunately Jim Jordan and others in Congress want to get to the bottom of this, and also Ken Paxton, that all these companies get rated and that's going to affect your your loans, your lending, your interest rate, and compliance to this environmental agenda. And it's a lot further. I, I, I knew they were far, but I had no idea. Just the Schwab website. I'm sure other uh, 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 brokerage companies have the same. I mean, they had the rating. I, I saw one had 2% environmental, 6% global and uh, or, uh, governance, and 3% uh, and, uh, uh, environmental. Just, I mean, it's, it's incredible to see this. But he thinks the time has come to bring people together because we see a degradation of trust in the world, and trust only builds through personal relations. And the World Economic Forum, in a broader sense, is a community of, of multitask holders, businesses, governments, civil societies, and young generations to work together. The common past, their future uh, past for flight, uh, possibly even a... Uh, a passport, uh, your COVID, uh, you know, uh, that'd be part of your, co uh, if COVID or something like that comes again, uh, you'll have the common pass that will show whether you've been uh, vaccinated or not. And as I shared, Bill uh, Gates funded uh, an MIT Rice University uh, program that you could put under a black light uh, to determine whether someone had had the coronavirus uh, vaccine or not. They never, they never put that in place during the coronavirus, but they were certainly at work on trying to perfect that to be able to determine whether someone's had the shot or not. And then facial recognition, uh, the global entry facial recognition, um, no electronic boarding pass, no passport, only a photo of a face. Uh, I was on a flight uh, last, uh, last year on the way to Jerusalem for the prayer breakfast, and I went from Washington, D.C. to Brussels, and they said, just hand your passport and your boarding pass to the attendant, and the machine's going to take your picture. And if you get the green arrow, you're approved. Your face has been approved. This is facial recognition. And I turned my face like that, and it took a photo of the side of my face. And that was, that was good. They had just enough on the side of my face, and I was, I was approved, given my passport and my a boarding pass and moved on to the flight. Right side, yes. It was the right. <laughs> Tommy, you're priceless. <laughs> so it's convenience, security, and ease of use and safety. That's that's part of the that's part of the, the plan. But here's uh this is um, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, some of our geniuses. Uh, they have, this is how facial recognition operates. And Nathan Jones, who works with Dave uh, Reagan, did a, a presentation about a year and a half ago, I saw him do, showed commuters coming off a train in China, and there was a, a number on every single face, plus five, minus six, minus 10, plus five. That's how good facial recognition is becoming. And that's what they want to do now with passports, driver's license, on and on. And you can't fight it. I mean, this is just, this is, this is happening. And then truth and common sense under attack as well as Judeo-Christian values. We're watching this battle between the evangelical Christians and the Protestants, even the Catholics. A rebellion 
accusations that we are trying to create a Christian nation. Hate speech versus freedom of speech. 80% of college campuses, as I mentioned earlier, they don't want to hear us. Christians are bigots and intolerant. We're nutcases. But Christians against Christian nationalism. Christians, these are liberal theologians from Northeast universities, and that's spreading to even seminaries. Christian nationalism is a Christianity-affiliated religious nationalism. Christian nationalists primarily focus on internal politics, such as passing laws that reflect their view of Christianity and its role in political and social life. We are going to be under more and more attack as we push back and as we try to get more involved and as we, as we push back this challenge, they're going to be pushing us. They got, the, they got the social networks, they've got mainstream media, and they're going to say we are the problem. The evangelicals don't know how it's going to play out, but the, the war is on. And it's seeking that we're seeking to preserve the status of a Christian state, uphold an anti-establishmentarian position. Christian nationalists support the presence of Christian symbols and statuary in the public square, as well as state patronage for the display of religion, such as school prayer and the exhibition of nativity scenes during Christmas tide or the Christian cross or Good Friday. This is a problem for the other part of the church. Seven Christian, or seven deadly sins of white Christian nationalism. And this is a book here, The Psychology of Christian Nationalism. So this is gonna, this is gonna continue. And then the Phillips Theological Seminary said the United States is not God's chosen nation. The United States is a nation and not a church. Or when you hear separation of church and state, well, that had to do with the fact that our founders did not want a national church. But our Judeo-Christian values, when you look at Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, and other believers that wrote our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and when you look every year at George Washington and Abraham Lincoln's proclamation at Thanksgiving, wow! Can you imagine living in a time like this when we absolutely had a fear of God? And the theologians of the 18th century, when there was big, massive hurricanes or tornadoes that would destroy communities, they would repent and say, God, we don't know what we have done to wrong you, but we repent because they knew that these events were uh, of fury or fire of, of the God of Israel, or our Lord. And they would repent. We've lost the fear of God. We really have. But um, going forward, uh, Tanya and I are encouraged because the believers need Jesus. And I tell you, this is a time like we've never, you know, we're living in very serious, very challenging, very difficult times. Never thought we'd live in a day like this. But Tanya and I uh, feel uh, compelled to, to encourage others. I mean, Tanya, I, I hear her sometimes four or five in the morning in serious warfare prayer and prayer with her friends in Brazil. And they know how to take it on. And our prayer, warfare prayer, intercession, praying for leaders, you know, praying for us daily. And, and I give Tanya a lot of credit. More time in the prayer, more time in personal prayer, more time in the word. You know, we need to do this. We need to press in like never before. Because without an understanding and, and, and out a supernatural impartation of the Lord through the Holy Spirit, it is going to become more and more difficult to handle these times. And it's also important that when they see the joy of Jesus on us, at a time, they'll go, what? how do you have joy in a time such as this? What a perfect time to talk to them about Jesus. 
or the young Generation Z that's been influenced by TikTok. TikTok's raising them, not their parents. Where you got half the 18 year, the half the teenagers that watch TikTok, half the women teenagers that watch TikTok, that have thought about killing themselves in the last 12 months, according to polls. Or this doom and gloom. I mean, these young people are hearing the fact that we have 12 more years to get the, the earth, in, like Al Gore and Prince Charles, that we have 12 more years to get things in order. Or that we are going to bankrupt them with the $33 trillion worth of debt, that we're going to bankrupt them and there's going to be nothing left for them. A lot of them, and, and they're not being fed the gospel. But the young people that we've met that have come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior are on fire. I see them in Brazil. We hear about it in South America. We have some young guys that we're working with right now. They're, they're doing revivals in California, and young people are coming to Jesus. You know, in the, the, the discussion over the last few years, uh, and a lot of us, especially us that, that follow Bible prophecies so closely, uh, I, 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 I have not seen a revival coming. But there is a hope that we will have a revival before the Lord comes for us. And I certainly, over the last 20, 25 years, there's a lot of things I thought were going to happen didn't happen. I've, gone, I've lived through a lot of Rosh Hashanahs thinking that that might be the one where Jesus picks us up and takes us home and it didn't happen. We're still here. So we're getting, we're, we're, we know the signs. Thank God we're the part of the church that understands Genesis to Revelation, and we can look at his book and understand that these are significant times, not normal times, and that we are going to have the opportunity to come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And that's what Tanya and I are committed to. And I pray the encouragement to you all too. Friends, people you come into contact, family members. I had two family members give their life to Christ just before they passed away. My fighter pilot dad did. 12 days as a marine fighter pilot, right before he came, he, he left to be with the Lord, he came to Jesus. So keep praying for those family members, friends, or whoever the Lord puts in your heart and let the Holy Spirit do the work. Take the pressure off yourself and just be yielded and ready to speak through me, Lord, to my friends. Speak through me. And the, and, and the other thing we're seeing over and over again <clears throat> the people the Lord is divinely putting us next to supernaturally. We're going to have more and more of that too. I'm already seeing it. I'm already hearing it. So be sensitive to your family, your friends, and whoever the Lord puts you near and around so we can seize this moment. He, we Again, we are so blessed to have a biblical understanding of the significance of this time and there's a responsibility for us to do something with it. There's no excuse. And one other thing, this life is preparing us for eternity. Uh, Bill Lawrence, uh, Dallas Seminary Bible teacher, said one day in our Bible study that this is, this life is a preparation for eternity. So let's get ready, and let's keep pressing in and uh, making a difference and change. And may people in our family see a transformation in our lives as well. So um, what a blessing it is to be living in a day such as this. Tommy. Uh, okay, we're going to now resume questions for Brother Bill. Sure. So come to the mics and let her rip. Tater chip. Let it slide, Clyde. Okay, here we come. Thank you. Uh, what is your take on Argentina's new president-elect, uh, Javier uh, Mileu? Um, do you see this as uh, him as significant or flash in a pan or nothing to uh, nothing to see here. Javier in, in Argentina? Yes. Or, I don't know yet. Tony might have an idea, but uh, uh, they call him the Trump of the tropics, or kind of like what they did with Bolsonaro. So I don't, I don't know a lot about him yet. Yes, yes. Um, 
uh, you know, I, I don't know. I guess I know that uh, uh, Bolsonaro and Trump both tweeted congratulations to him. I just don't know enough, but that's a significant country. They've got a lot of problems. Um, I know there's some tension, according to Tony, between Brazil and uh, Argentina, and um, I, I don't know. Uh, Lula has been treated as a hero in China, in Russia, at global warming conferences. He's also attempted to get uh, Brazil into the BRICS. That's uh, uh, South a South America. I mean, no, South Africa, uh, China, Brazil, India, Russia. I don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, here here's a guy that the White House, Biden's White House, helped get elected, and he's all but just kind of shoved us aside, and his really gone after a closer relationship with China, Russia, and uh, South Africa, Iran, Saudi Arabia, especially Iran. So I, I just, long answer to your question, I just don't know yet. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, thank you first for the uh, fire hose. That's a lot to digest, but I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I do have a question. When we talked about the voting and the um, you know, possible you know, fraud that was doing, most of the voting, there's usually exit polling. Has there been some kind of a correlation that, that where they go together or do they diverge, the exit polling and the uh, voting that you know of? Uh, say that one more time. So the divergence between the exit poll and the actual vote? Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that can be a problem. The, the exit polls usually were pretty, I, I guess it all depends on the race. The exit polls in some places were were, were more accurate in other places not. I just don't know okay. how accurate exit polls are. Uh, the, the big concern about exit polls is uh, making sure that everybody goes and votes and, and when they hear exit polls sometimes that keeps people at home rather than voting say, oh, that's not worth it anyhow. So I, I think they're going to be a lot more careful about releasing exit polls before their votes tallied. Even for states out west, uh, they could influence an election there especially right. on the presidential election, so uh, I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh-huh. If President Trump would, by chance, win this election in 2024, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, my impression is there's going to be a very big divide in the country and probably a lot of uh, riots. What do you think? I'm afraid you're right. When you look at the pattern of 2020, when a lot of the major cities were boarded up because of the possibility of Trump being elected, and then again in uh, 22 to a lesser degree, um, I, 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 that's our side is uh, our side is reasonable. Our side is. Um, is not cantankerous. I mean, we're not divisive. We're not lawless. Unfortunately, the Black Lives pattern created a level of lawlessness. It's been acceptable. I mean, look what's happening in these major uh, retail stores and major blue cities that are they're just going in randomly and just robbing them. It's a it's a spirit of lawlessness no, that we're going to see at the end times. And unfortunately, I, I, that's a good question. I think we'll see it. it. I think it could get really bad. I think it's like Gotham City and Batman. What about Batman? <laughs> yeah, Gotham City and Batman. <laughs> Gotham City, yeah. But uh, an extra on this question is the Republican Party, do you think they are strong enough to, to take the axe in their hand and actually do some governing, or are they just going to be just... Uh, it really is a concern. Yeah. Uh, the Republican I mean, Party. Here's a, here's a quick note. Um, in the 2020 election, when Trump started questioning the outcome in Georgia, mm -hmm. we still had two Senate races that were up. They were in runoffs. And I think, I, don't ha I haven't proved this, but Karl Rove and some of the Republican establishment said don't support Trump in Georgia because we got enough votes to win those two races. Well, I think 20, 25% of the Trump supporters in Georgia said, oh, 
they were mad and they stayed home. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we'll show them. So we lost the majority in the, in the uh, U.S. Senate. According to Senator Tim Scott, the fact we lost the majority in the Senate cost us $4 trillion in additional debt. And that, and that was so costly. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, unfortunately, we, we just need good candidates. I know. And there's a battle between uh, uh, moderates and conservatives in the Republican Party and have for a long time. The Democrats operate well in the, in the minority because they have the mainstream media with them and the social networks. When we're in the majority, it was like, uh, or in the minority, it's like deer's eyes and headlights. And then we have that division. The other, the other thing that was concerned, the uh, Romney's uh, niece, who heads up the Republican Party, or the RNC, they had a big event at Mar-a-Lago, the log cabin event. Uh, and the log cabin is the, is the gay conservatives. And, um, you know, there's, it's a slippery slope. Our party, if we're all conservatives, I feel a lot more comfortable. And unfortunately, part of our big problem is we have a battle with the, cons with the moderates in the Republican Party, which has kept us out of the majority more, yeah. to, more than a couple times. I think it's the lack of unity and, and uh, oh, no doubt. In hindsight. Uh, no doubt. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Bill. Always look forward to you coming. Thank uh, you. I think you were so starting to hit on what I was going to point out, that it seems the battle we're facing this year, besides the election fraud and another stolen election, um, is the Republicans are not Republicans, but rhinos. Of course, Ron and McDaniel is one of the biggest problems the Republican Party faces now. That's right. Ron DeSantis, we all know, is bought and paid for by the Bush machine. Um, and surely they're all doing their part, just like the Democrats, to stop Trump. Um, after January 6th, I don't even watch Fox News anymore because they peddle the same things. Um, thoughts? Well, I tell you, I never thought, I mean, I, I never thought I'd get to this point, but I mean, after the midterm election last year, uh, I, I haven't watched Fox. Even Steve Bannon, who I listen to often, and he does a good job of exposing a lot of things, I've just completely shut out. Anything political, I just don't want to hear about it. I never thought, I mean, I'm still going to vote conservative. I'm kind of, still kind of keeping an eye on things, but I have no interest. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. And these people that are running for president, I mean, come on. This is, this is a joke. And the problem is we got people in the United States that are incredibly successful business people that would run for president like Trump, but they don't want to put themselves through it. I know of a couple that have said, no way I will ever run for president, even though they would be great presidents because of what the mainstream media puts them through. Yeah. Well, it, and it seems RFK Jr. to me seems, uh, in the beginning, I thought, well, this guy seems fine, but he's seeming more and more liberal. Uh, of course, his past is very liberal. Oh, yes. But he seems to be more of a liberal plant to take away votes from Trump then he is even from Biden. Um, I, I can't help but look at Trump as sort of the Winston Churchill of our time and uh, maybe one of our last great leaders. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, um, you know, Trump, can't, again, can't, can't imagine what he goes through on a daily basis. I mean, right now he's still the guy. But they're going to do everything they can, state, state, federal. They're going to do everything they can to destroy his life, his family, his business. It's, it's brutal, and it's uncalled for. And this is part of the reason I just don't care to follow this. And I never, I mean, all the years I've been, 20 years in Washington, D.C., I just don't want to, I just yuck. It's so absurd. We don't think like these people, and the whole political world is just nuts. And then we see the, then we see the division within our own political party, the Republican Party, and that's crazy. And then the slip, I mean slippage, you, 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 we keep giving up territory. And then this battle between good and evil, 
I, I, I don't know. I, I certainly know who the Republicans are. That's cer certainly know who I'm going to vote for. But as far as trying to st stamp with this on a daily basis, I have more important things to do in my life than uh, follow that. So uh, only God knows how this is going to play out. Yes, sir. Bill, I, I heard a commentator on a, a TV show, I guess a couple weeks ago, about the Hamas attack on Israel. And he mentioned that Hamas totally under, underestimated the strength of the retaliation that Israel uh, made to that attack. Uh, do you have any comments or anything on that? Uh, I mean, I can't see how they couldn't expect a really strong response. Um, Avi Lipkin, uh, Israeli, Jewish Israeli, uh, that a lot, of, a lot of the guys here know, said that the Arabs have a tendency to get real worked up and go to war too early. And I think in some ways Hamas thought that uh, uh, Hezbollah might get involved and Iran, and they haven't. So they're kind of shocked that they haven't. Um, I think having our aircraft carriers in the area has certainly helped. And um, even with this president. Maybe they're, maybe they're waiting on Gog and Magog. Could be, Tommy. Could be. But I, 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 I think that um, I, Iran is the one... Or, Iran and Turkey are the ones to watch. Turkey. They're the ones to watch. Watch what Erdogan says. I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow him a lot more closely. I follow him closely, but even more so now. And, and Khomeini and uh, Rizi and Putin, too. But that Erdogan, that, you know, he's oh, part, of, part of NATO. Just in the last week, he's gotten oh, really belligerent. Absolutely. You know, Ab yeah. Erdogan. Yeah, he did. more and more so the last week to 10 days. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to make the point that uh, it seems that uh, what's happening, like within the Texas House, uh, they, this past session, <clears throat> you know, it's it's become evident that there are those that that don't support the the Republican platform, uh, and are probably Democrats that are are running for office in the Republican Party, uh, and. We as voters are not staying aware of what they're doing, their tactics. And so what we saw in the Texas House this, this past session was um, they're uh, just stonewalling a lot of conservative uh, legislation that was coming through. And so we've got to pay more attention to, uh, to those that support the and, and do not support the Republican platform, and uh, and actually are, are the Democrats just seem to have a second wind, and we're exhausted. I think the Republicans are just my gosh, it's just constantly keeping the dam from being burst, and the Democrats have had a free run. They got the media, they got the social networks, and they're like they're catching a second wind. And you're right. I mean they're. And I've heard of that happening with uh, some of the House seats. We've got Democrats running as Republicans, getting elected, and then going with the other side. I mean, we're exhausted. And the, the other exhaustion is the fact that the Republican Party is divided between the conservatives and the, and the uh, moderates. Yeah, I think that the Democrats also are crossing over in their voting in the Republican primaries for, that, yeah, for candidates. That's, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. That has happened. So and they, and they, they should stop that. Uh, you know, the, the, these elections are run by the state. They're federal election, but they're run by the state. But, I mean, that should be stopped the best we can, uh, where they can't do that. Yeah, the Texas scorecard has, has done a great job in, in reporting what uh, the Texas House was actually doing and what was taking place there. But we need uh, some exposure of those things, uh, and they're they're doing a good job, and we're probably going to see a number of uh, of uh, congressmen that won't be running or that will either get taken out of office in the Republican Party because of 
of the reporting that was done on the last session with the, with this uh, corrupt. Well, hopefully that'll happen. We just need better candidates. I mean, that's just the bottom line. When you think about some of the opportunities that the Republicans had to win the Senate over the last 20 years, we've just had horrible candidates. Yes, Very bad. I mean, we've got to have better candidates. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and that's been a big factor. Let's, let's put people in that can win. And it, unfortunately, that doesn't happen often enough. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Joe. Hey, Bill. Thank you so much. Uh, always a always a blessing very Thanks. insightful Thanks. we all know that we're fighting a spiritual battle in all this and uh, I believe that God has left the church here until he takes us out of here as a source of major salt and light and uh, he says that we're to expose the works of darkness and the thing that has given us and I lead my congregation in these what I call tactical praying and that is um, just praying some uh, specific scriptures and the the foundation is <clears throat> excuse me psalm 50 verse 15 it says call upon me in the day of trouble and i will rescue you and you will honor me well we're in a day of trouble and then specific personalized prayers uh, i mean if they're good enough for david and the psalmists and he answered those prayers for them maybe He'll answer him for us. He's sovereign. He doesn't have to. We, we know the trend. We're in apostasy. And yet, maybe there'll be pockets of pausing this evil. Maybe there'll be a, a time of awakening uh, temporarily. But <clears throat> listen to this. This is awesome. Psalm 33.10, the Lord frustrates the plans of the heathen. He keeps them from carrying out their schemes. New American Standard says he nullifies their counsel. Uh, another translation says he thwarts their plans. I like that. I want him to do that. Uh, Psalm, uh, oh, I love this one. This is for the media. Psalm 74, 22, rise up, O God, defend your cause. Remember the insults that fools bring against you all day long. And then Psalm 140, do not grant the wicked their desires, Lord. Do not let them their plans succeed. And then finally, from Psalm 141, 10, let the wicked fall into their own nets, but let us escape. And then Psalm 146, Verse 9, the second part, turn the plans of the wicked upside down. So I think there's hope in praying the scriptures. And uh, again, he's a sovereign God. He can choose to answer them. Or he says, no, I'm not going to answer that. But at least it gives us a hope, uh, something tangible to, to pray for. Yes. Yeah, Joe, absolutely. I mean, we've got to do something. And we've got to take it, you know, use the word of God, use that weapon the Lord's given us. Two things. One, we know what's going on. We know these are unusual times. We know the Lord's returning. Very possible the generation that will see the Lord returning and then use the weapon, which is the Word of God. And we just need more people committed to that. Unfortunately, the, you know, the, we have a lot of problems in the churches and the seminaries. And, you know, we are part of our biggest battle. Not so much the maybe Republican Party to a certain extent, but the biggest problem right now is just the battle in the church and we're seeing a slippage in seminaries and in pastors and again 65 percent of the church in america doesn't know the biblical significance of what's taking place today in israel in a hundred million u.s one billion worldwide so i'm just i'm just glad i'm born again and can see it like y'all that we can see that we understand what to watch thank god for that that we are born again and fully understand the biblical significance of the days that we're living in. And stay, and stay occupied till he comes. And that's the other key. Stay occupied till he comes. We could all use a break. We've got to make sure we do our Sabbath, which is not always that easy. But at least take a day off of week. Get your rest and stay at it. But uh, we, we, need, we, have, we have things to do. God didn't give us the prophetic scriptures for us not to do anything. We've got to do something. And at a time like this,
Prayer is key. Prayer is essential. Just, um, I, we're, we're just wondering if you would speak to the situation at the border a little bit, and especially the Chinese nationalists that just showed up. Well, um, when Governor Abbott and the governor of Arizona started sending refugees to New York City and Chicago and Philadelphia and Boston and filling their cities, and they started, the Democrats started saying, hey, we've got a problem. It's absolutely unbelievable what Texas has had to put up with. And, I mean, we, had, we, we were making sincere, significant headway when Trump was in office. And then we had that fence. I mean, fence, I mean there are a lot, a lot of countries around the world that have fences around them. You know, and, and, and it's a travesty uh, what, what's happened. We feel for the plight of the people that are trying to find a better way and a better life. But unfortunately, uh, like Trump said, we're not getting their best when he, when he said in the, in, when he was in office. And uh, Texas has done what they can to, to stand up. I think Biden administration is uh, open to a, some kind of fence right now. Uh, that's, that's great. But uh, I don't know where it was. I don't know, Texas absorbed many, many of those folks. Did you see where all the Chinese nationalists have showed up? I've heard they're starting to come in. I don't know how many are here. Hello. How many? I, I don't remember how many. But, but I, hear, I hear that they are coming in, Chinese yeah, nationalists. Yeah, there's, there's a whole line of them in the news, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Uh, Bill, what do you know about what uh, Barack was doing before the event in was it October seventh? You know how there he was he was behind all of these rallies, Ehad Barak, you know in Israel, you know where they would. Uh, it it seemed like he was trying to well he was trying to undermine uh, the current government over Ehud Barak. Yes, are you aware? I, I've read that he was behind all of this. I, I haven't seen that, Tommy, but I, I, I know that uh, he always has a tendency to say something when you just can't believe he says it. And he and, he's, he and Netanyahu have bad, it's been bad blood for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Ehud Barak's the one that uh, uh, spent 34 different times seeing Epstein in New York City. You know, he's he's got a questionable background. You know, he was a true hero for Israel. There's right, no, he's no a, doubt about that, but he's problematic. He's super liberal, super secular, and divisive. Yeah, he's the greatest decorated soldier in the history of the IDF. Yeah, but, yeah true hero, but, but yeah. he is one of the most divisive, if not the most divisive political leader Israel's ever had in office. Right. Well, I have read a number of places he was behind all of these protests and organizing it. It was well-funded, you know, and this kind of stuff of everybody, all these people that wouldn't serve in the IDF and all that. But... And I'm just cur wondering if you have an opinion on what might happen as a result of the one-day unification of the nation of Israel. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, Tommy. The, the unification only on a military standpoint, but there, the, then Israel has their differences between the political parties. Right. Anyhow, it's a parliamentary uh, government. Uh, the, the right always tends to do business with the Orthodox Jews, and that's, that becomes problematic in itself because it's real hard for Jewish believers to move to Israel because of the, the, the grip that the Shaz has over, uh, over Israeli politics. But uh, it's, you, know, you can't imagine being a prime minister in a government like that, that all the compromises that one does take in order to keep the coalition together. And the last coalition in Israel was an anti-Netanyahu coalition, right. the most dysfunctional government we, there ever was in Israel. And this is a conservative government with extremes. But it was a lot better than that anti-Netanyahu uh, right. government. And we all like Netanyahu. We like him. He's a courageous right. guy. But Netanyahu's good. He, he treats his enemies better than his friends. And he's also never helped bring up anybody else politically because everyone's a threat to him. So he's never helped this uh, rite of passage to a new government. Uh, uh, he just hasn't. He's, 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 he's about himself. So do you have any other comments in about what's happening in Israel? Well, um, Israel is going to have, to, I mean, they seem fully committed to eliminating Hamas. Will 
Tehran or will Iran and Hezbollah get in this now? But that's their plan is to eliminate Hamas. Unfortunately, as this continues, the international media and the social networks are going to make Israel look like a pariah, a genocide state, and it's not going to work, and it's going to become more and more difficult for Jews living in America and around the world because of that. And the Antichrist secular media is going to use that demonically influenced to create this situation, and more and more Jews are going to be moving to Israel. Right. Very prophetic, too. Yeah, 100,000 at least have come from uh, Ukraine. Yeah. But uh, I, I also think that pro I've seen seven or eight experts think our, uh, that uh, Hamas is not going to get involved, and very likely that's probably a setup for Gog and Magog. Uh, in other words, they're, they're, it could mean that they are going to, you know, be involved with Gog and Magog if that happens. Uh, well, so. it, it um, um, Erdogan really seems to be the guy, a uh, major right. player. He's gotten really, just the last three or four days, he is, he's threatening Israel. And, and some Greek scholars think, uh, you guys are scholars, you and Randall, and others think that, uh, I mean, uh, some Greek scholars believe that Erdogan's going to have a greater influence than, the, than the Putin or the head of Russia in terms of that Gog Magog uh, formation. Well, four of those uh, people groups are, are in modern day Turkey, you know, that come down with uh, Russia. Right. You know, and stuff. Yeah, I, I um, Tehran, I mean, Iran, timing. Israel's determined nation of the red line. The possibility of uh, Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39, dealing with modern, day, or Elam, which is modern day Iran. The, Isaiah 17, 1, the flattening of Damascus. Um, so, I, but I mean, the, main, the international players right now, the most significant is the president of Khomeini and the president of Iran and Erdogan and Xi Jinping, uh, another, out, another outsider, and Putin too, but I, I think Iran and Turkey have the biggest uh, decision right now on what, right. what they do. Yes. The white elephant in the room, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, what do you think this is going to affect the Gog and Magog uh, thing? What it did, it brought Turkey, no, excuse me, what it did, it brought Iran and Russia closer together, a different level of military cooperation. Iran was providing uh, drones to Russia to use in the Ukraine. Uh, Russia was furious. Some of the Russian leaders were furious at that Israel supported the Ukraine at the United Nations on some votes, which affected that relationship. And some people have even said, some insiders are saying Iran is calling a lot of shots right now with Russia and have a lot of influence over them and even back channel uh, talks between the Russians and Iranians have been taking place in the Caucasian mountains for the last 12 months. Russia's gonna be providing jets they're also talking about S-300 and S-400s to Turkey, missile defense systems. And, I mean, Turkey's in NATO, but close to Russia. So something's going to give at some point. But the Ukraine was almost a catalyst that brought these sides closer together uh, for, the, for the final eight conflicts of Ezekiel 38 and 39 and possibly Jeremiah 49. Yeah, there's some articles out there that uh, Turkey has already pulled out of NATO. Uh, but I can't verify, you know, there was one or two of them, but if that happened, there would be a lot more articles in that. So I don't know if that's speculation. That's not definitely something to watch because yeah. also the United States, when Trump was in office, there was talk of us moving out of our military base that we have in Turkey. Right. Right. That was a big, that almost happened because the tension between uh, uh, Trump and uh, Erdogan was very significant. And we have 20, we have, I think, up to 25 nukes at that base 
and we put two B-1 bombers in there in the last two or three weeks and left them there. So how ironic is that, that we have a very important base to handle the Middle East in Turkey? Well, the, the largest or the most activity at any airport in the world is there in Turkey. Is that right? Yeah, as far as a civilian airport. Oh, the Istanbul. Oh, there, Istanbul, yeah. I've yeah, flown, it's, I've yeah, flown it's, through there a It's probably of one of the top three or four. Dubai, Atlanta. Well, they say Atlanta, it's the busiest BF. airport in the world. Is it really? Yeah. I, I didn't I've know it was that high yet, but I know it's, it was high. But Dubai, Atlanta, DFW, Istanbul, um, fascinating. If Turkey starts the war with, with uh, Israel, then this is going to be a very problematic problem in the NATO because the U.S. is defending Israel, NATO, it's going to be a mess. So, so that will be, a, it's going to be an interesting 12 months. Interesting between now and the end of the, I mean, here we have the FBI director warning us twice in the last two weeks, we have to be open to terror alerts. Yeah, open to terror alerts. Yeah, and that's right. Well, and that's why uh, the EU doesn't want Turkey, because they would then be the uh, basis for all the Muslims coming into the in Europe. I mean, not that that's not already happening, but it would be terrible, and that's the number one reason no one thinks that uh, Turkey would, would ever be involved in the it, EU. It would be official if... If the, if the European Union, let Turkey become an European Union, then every Muslim can go to the borders un, exactly. uncensored, and then it would just be the flood, the floodgates of Muslim, and then Europe is gone. But prophetically, we don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I'm looking forward to your report for next year. <laughs> only, only God, I wouldn't even know where to start. With what I know now, I won't. Even, I wouldn't even be close to. If I start putting an outline together, only. Oh my gosh! But you can start at six o'clock instead of seven. <laughs> oh yeah, and oh my, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even be able to predict what's coming. Oh my gosh! Go, go ahead. I just have a simple question. Um, with all of our involvement around the world, and uh, the issues that are taking place with the various countries that we're involved in. How do you think that this will be used in the next election cycle uh, as, it, as we build up this year towards this presidential election? Say that one more time, the first part. So with all of our involvement in, in the world, in various different locations, how do you think that the Democrats specifically will be using that for nefarious purposes in this next election cycle coming up? Boy, I don't know. They're, they're kind of in a, a difficult position there. You know, they're big supporters of money for the Ukraine. Fortunately, the Republicans are standing up against that. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty worried. Uh, they're worried because of Kennedy taking more votes from, uh, from the Democrats. Newsom's not a superstar by any stretch. Harris certainly isn't. Uh, Biden, you know, he's not all there. And uh, to be kind. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just think... Fortunately and hopefully, a lot of this helps. I mean, because the, the Democrats, as I share, are going to run on abortion big time, and they think that's going to carry them into into victories. So we just pr we just pray that something will happen. This is a dis this. There will be more and more political disruption, and the Democrats will uh, the people that voted for the Democrats are going to say, "Boy, they're, my life isn't getting better. It was better under Trump." Um, things are not going well, and they're going to make a decision to stay at home or not vote. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, this Gerd Wilders, uh, Tanya's lived 32 years, as mentioned, in the Netherlands, and we talk about a real brave guy. Is this Gerd Wilders from the Netherlands who just won? He's going to have a difficult time putting a coalition but he said two things in the last couple of weeks. We already have a Palestinian state. It's Jordan. And second thing, and you know, we, he, they're in NATO, but they'll never get in the European Union. They'll never let Turkey in the European Union. But uh, we're going to see more strong leaders like Wilders uh, in Europe because it's, it's getting worse and worse for them. So I think this is going to be very positive. Yes, that's Argentina. Pro, our new uh, president. 
pro-Israel, Jewish, pro-Christian. So that's the new Argentina leader, and they certainly need a good, strong leader. And Gert Wieler, I mean, this guy calls Islam. He, he is totally against immigration into the Netherlands. The other lady that won a lot of votes was Turkish. And the, 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 the Muslims in, in the Netherlands just can't even believe that Gert Wilders was elected, but there is a, uh, a fatigue and frustration of people that have had to live under the radicalism. And I tell you, this prime minister of the UK, he's another guy that stands strong with Israel. He's uh, an Indian descent. He is one sharp guy. And he's, t I mean, and, and they, you know, they call London, Lundistan. There's so many Arabs in London. I mean, there's areas that the police won't even go, and Sharia law operates in, in, the, in, in London. But I think we're going to see some leaders like Gerd Wilders and some others that raise themselves up that can be big players. That can, that's what it's going to take, and that's what it's going to take here in America, with strong leaders. L last Trump. question. Thank you. Last question. Go ahead. Just for encouragement, Bill, uh, isn't it uh, wonderful to see in God's providence that uh, we got uh, Johnson as the uh, up the end as there. So uh, he's not our savior, but we do need to pray for him, and that he is. Uh, it seems to be a, a good conservative. He's got a big fight. So uh, let's can let's let's pray for Mike Johnson as he's there. Why don't you lead us in prayer? Sure. Thank you, Father, for tonight. Help us. Help us to see as you would see. Help us to be men and women of God. Wherever the influence that you be pleased to give us, to be instruments of thy precious hand. May our hands and our minds be in the word. May in your providence cause us to look to our neighbors, to friends, to strangers, to speak a word. If you would be pleased to raise even someone here to have influence in government, whether in local or national, may they be strong. May they find their help only in the Lord. May we as a society here at the pre-trib be careful in our walk with Christ. May we be, find, be found faithful servants of the living God that we might encourage one another, men and women of prayer, men and women of the word, the sticking true to the word, careful what we speak, careful God in how we act. Help us, O oh God. We're looking to you. We still pray that you might be pleased as you have so many times in America. The only reason we in America still stand is the revivals, uh, the first awakening, the second awakening, the, men, the <clears throat> layman's prayer revival, the pocket revivals of the 1900s. And we are a little dry, God. And we're looking to you. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. And give us strength to meet the day, the year, and keep looking up for your return. Be with Bill, special Lord, and his precious wife, Tommy, and others of this society. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You're dismissed.